Good afternoon, everyone. Again, welcome to my living room. Thanks for tuning in here and watching my little videos. I really do appreciate it. And I enjoy your company. Believe it or not, I know you're out there. So it's fun to do this. Anyway, we just celebrated Palm Sunday this past Sunday, didn't we? And we've got a few holidays coming up. We've got Good Friday, this coming Friday. And then Sunday is Easter or Resurrection Sunday. There's also another little holiday in there called Passover that the Jewish people celebrate. Jesus celebrated this, this holiday when he was alive on earth in physical form. Are, are you all aware of what Passover is about? I'm going to tell you just a little about it. If you've seen that old movie with Charlton Heston in it, Ten Commandments, you'll, know, you'll remember these scenes. There were several things that Moses did, you know, in trying to get Pharaoh to allow his people to leave the slavery in Egypt. And Pharaoh kept hardening his heart and refusing. Finally, God sent the angel of death over the city. It was a plague of sorts, but the Hebrews could escape from that by slaughtering a lamb and spreading the lamb's blood over the lintel and the doorposts of their doors around it. If the lamb's blood was there as the angel of death entered the city, it passed over those houses. It did not enter those houses. Now, nobody was immune unless they had the lamb's blood over their door. Even Pharaoh paid if the, if the plague or the angel of death entered because they didn't have the lamb's blood. Then the firstborn in that household died. Pharaoh's own son died, if you'll recall that scene because of it, because he had hardened his hearts. But if the lamb's blood was there, was there, it passed over those houses, Passover. And because of Jesus's death on the cross, what we celebrate Friday, as this, you know, chalice says, he's our covenant, he is our Passover lamb because he shed his blood for us. That is how he becomes our Passover lamb. You know, when I was a little child, and I mean a toddler, a little child. The very first song I ever learned was called At the Cross, and I learned the chorus of it. And I'm sure it was to the delight of the adults around me, having a little child sing this little chorus. Bear with me. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burdens on my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Our sight, we receive our sight at the cross. Our ability to see and to understand. We're talking about spiritual eyes here, not naked eyes. You know, the word tells us in Ephesians 6 to pull on the full armor of God. And in Ephesians 14, it talks about the breastplate of righteousness. I don't know if you can, well, I had it upside down here. This is all the full armor of God, and you'll note the breastplate of righteousness, we're to have that on. We're gonna talk about a little bit about righteousness today. Psalm 5, 8, and the Psalms were written by King David. Psalms 5, 8, he states, Lord, lead me in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. In James 3, 18, it says, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. If you are a maker of peace, you will reap a harvest of righteousness. That's a good thing. Don't be too contentious. Proverbs 14, 34. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin condemns my people. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin condemns my people. You know, David, a little bit more about King David when he was a very young man. We all probably remember the story about David and Goliath, the giant Philistine. He was probably seven or eight feet tall. He wore a full armor, you know, metal armor. He carried a spear and a sword, and he would taunt the Hebrews every day. And when young David, and let's say, went by young, I'm, I'm you know, they call him a young man. I'm thinking probably in his teens, his late teens, maybe. So he would have probably been kind of slight of build. And when he heard about Goliath, he asked in 1 Samuel 17, 26, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? He was incensed. He knew who he was. 
he knew. And when he finally, when they allowed him to face Goliath, which they didn't want to do at first, but he talked them into it, he gave God all the credit in this win. In 1 Samuel 17, 17, when, God, when Goliath came at him and was taunting him, you know, oh, you're like you pipsqueak, you know, in essence, calling him that year of nothing. You know, Goliath was all decked out in his metal finery, his armory, armor, and had his sword, and he threatened David, and David answered him when he talked to Goliath. It is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, that the Lord gives. No, that the Lord saves, excuse me. For the battle is the Lord, and he will give all of you into our hands. David was a righteous man of God. In fact, God called him a man after his own heart. Now, that's how he started out. He used to dance in celebration before the Lord. He played musical instruments. As King Saul, the king previous to him, used to have him. He would suffer anxiety, and when he would ask David to come and play for him, the songs calmed his spirit. So he was often called to play his instruments for Saul. That being said, we've also all heard the story about David and Bathsheba. Mm, things got messed up then, didn't, didn't it? He saw Bathsheba bathing. He lusted after her. He had her husband killed in battle. And he, so he was a man of great sin as well. He, uh, in that, he, the, when David and Bathsheba had their first child, a son, he, he, he died. David lost other sons later in battle. So he, he had to pay for his sin, but he also repented of his sin. He was a great repenter. I mean, he would prostrate himself before God. Oh God, I have sinned. You know, that type of thing, like when he did with Bathsheba, when he repented about that. You know, there was another time when David's intention was good, but something else happened. In 1 Chronicles 13, 9 to 10, when he wanted to move the Ark of God from where it was to a place in Jerusalem where he, it belonged. And he didn't bother to check out in Exodus 29, God's way of moving that Ark. He didn't bother to check how to do that. He just kind of, they put it on a cart and pulled by oxen and they were people traveling around the cart. Uzzah was one of those people. One of the oxen or the oxen stumbled and Uzzah reached up to steady the Ark. And when he touched it, he was struck dead by the Lord. When David heard about that, oh, he was absolutely beside himself. And then he decided to check out Exodus 29 and the way that God wanted the ark to be transported. One of the ways was that only the Levitical priests were to be able to be around the ark at all. They had to go through all kinds of rituals to prepare for transporting, but only they could transport the ark. In 1 Chronicles 15, 12, David says, no one but the Levites may carry the ark of God. So that's, and that's what the Lord said. Long story short, he was successful in moving the ark because he wanted to do things God's way. Now that's righteousness. Details that he hadn't followed, that God wanted followed. Details matter to God. God's instructions matter to him. David loved God, and he wanted to please God. And that's where we need to be, to be righteous before God. I want to please you, God, because I love you. Is this you? Are you at that place where you're ready? That you love God enough that you want to please him, to be righteous and obey him no matter what it is? There's some benefits to righteousness. In James 5, 16, the prayers of a righteous person avails much, or they're powerful and effective. In 1 Peter 3, 12, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. That's pretty darn significant, isn't it? That's when things start to happen. Spiritual blindness, not good. That's where it's sourced in rebellion and sin. Are you willing to give that up? That's a challenge for you today. Do you want to be free to see 
what God is doing and to have your prayers answered. Oh, very good things. Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Are you ready, as David says, to say to God, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me. Are you ready to say that to God and mean it? In Psalm 51.10, it also says, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. You know, back when, we used to sing that verse. And the Psalms, in fact, are songs. David sung them. This might be the, not the exact melody of what we sang, but they were songs nonetheless. Create in me a clean heart or a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. There's more to it, but you get the gist. And when we can honestly get to the point where we are willing to sincerely pray that to God and say that to God from our heart, and we mean it, bear all before God, because he sees it anyway. I mean, you know that he sees this. Even a child, I, I knew. It's like, well, God, you can see what I'm thinking and doing anyway, so I might as well just lay it out there for you. Even as a child, I knew that one. Like, duh, you know, one of those things. Then in Joel 2, 25, it says, I will repay or restore all the years the locusts have eaten or stolen. And I'm sure we all want that. We want everything restored. Yes, we make mistakes. Our responsibility is to find out through God's word and prayer exactly what God says and wants. And then we need to repent and see if he won't restore to you all the things that, think that have been stolen from you, that are truly meaningful to you and to your life, all of those things. Now, he might not do it in your time frame. He's pretty sovereign about that, and he's going to do it in his own way. It, it, it might, you can, if you want to go ahead and lay out all the way you think it should happen, do so, but I, I've learned from experience that's pretty ineffective. He usually doesn't do it my way, or the way I think it should happen. But he is faithful. His arm is not short. He can do it. He will do it. In God's kingdom, in heaven, all is righteous and holy and perfect. Now keep that in mind as we close, because we're going to close with the Our Father, the Lord's Prayer, which Jesus said in this, on the Sermon on the Mount, that that's the perfect way to pray, and that was how we should be praying. So let's, let's perceive the part about God's kingdom. For those who can hear this, listen. It's the perfect prayer. Our Father, who are in heaven, hallowed or holy be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, our sins, the wrong things we've done, the people we've hurt, as we forgive those who trespass against us as we forgive us, as we forgive those who have devastated and hurt us and crossed the line. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Don't let Satan come near us. Put a hedge of protection around us, Lord. For you, Lord, are the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Did you pray that with me today? I would suggest that you look at my video one more time. Jot down those scripture verses. Look them up. Use a concordance or any Bible aid that you have at your disposal. And you seek God's face. And you know, a lot of people say, follow your heart. Yeah, you won't go wrong if you follow your heart. Well, you know what? The word says that our heart is deceitful above all things. Mm. Unless it's redeemed. Let's go about our Father's business today. While you're forced to be at home right now during this time, this is a good time to do what you need to be doing. You know there's a lot of conspiracy theories out there, and some conspiracies really are real. There are conspiracies. But you know what? Our duty right now is to personally seek God and what he would have us to be doing in this season. 
Thank you for watching. I'll be with you shortly again. God bless you, and I love you.